The Rebel Capitalist Show. Let's move over to uranium. I'd love to get your uh, overall view. We talked about this on a panel discussion with Mark Moss the other day that we were involved yeah. with, which was great. Um, but if you could give us kind of your your broad view of what's happening with uranium. I know you, I think you t- said on our panel that it might be a good opportunity because we've had such a big pullback here. And then after that, if you could help us just give us kind of an elementary view of what happened with the Sprott Trust buying up a lot of physical uranium. Because I think people have heard about that, but they might not understand how that actually worked. Uh, with the caveat that I'm retired, I no longer speak for Sprott. Uh, yeah. I, I'm a director and a large shareholder, but I'm not a spokesperson for Sprott. And some of the things I say embarrass them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's go back to uranium. Uh, I, I've had a love affair with uranium that goes back a very long time. Uh, it's deeply cyclical. So for a contrarian, the fact that it's cyclical is great. But for a contrarian, what's even better is that most people either don't know about it or hate it. I remember advocating uh, uranium equity speculation in the year 2000. And I knew it was going to be a difficult sell because the sector hadn't performed since 1982, since Three Mile Island. And a sector that hasn't performed for 18 years doesn't get shown a lot of love. What surprised me was the amount of vitriol that I encountered from the dais, people sort of shouted out that I was advocating, speculating on Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl. Uh, And I was thinking as a contrarian, boy, it doesn't get better than this. Not only are they bored, they hate me, Uh, which meant that I had very, very, very little competition. Uh, I I remember thinking, uh, apropos comments earlier in this interview, in those days, the uranium price was at $8 a pound, and the International Energy Agency suggested that the fully loaded cost to produce a pound of uranium was 30 bucks. So the industry, in arithmetic terms, was losing $22 a pound and doing it 70 or 80 million times a year. It was extremely boring. Uh, well, it was worse than boring. So it, it was very clear to me that if the uranium price didn't go up, that there wouldn't be any uranium. And what would the impact of that to be? Well, very simply, the impact would be that the lights went out, uh, because irregardless of the fact that people were offended by Hiroshima and Nagasaki, people, when they enter a room and flip the switch, want the lights to come on. Uh, At that point in time, uranium provided uh, 19% uh, of the total electricity demand in the United States and about 25% of the baseload demand. So it was a pretty simple equation. Either the uranium price would go up or the lights would go out. And... That ensuing uranium bull market was the single most uh, exciting financial event of my career. At the beginning of that market, uranium was at eight bucks, and there were five junior uranium companies worldwide that had survived an 18-year bear market. By uh, six, seven years later, the price of uranium had risen to 140, and five companies had turned into 500 companies. The worst performing of the five juniors at the beginning of the cycle went up 22 to one. Uh, you know when to sell, Rick? Oh, well, I, I will admit I sold too early. Uh, what, what, what was, walk us through your, your minds. Cause I think, well, I was thinking if, the, if, the, high, if, but it's maybe even tougher to know when to sell. If the uranium price has to go to 30, I was thinking it'll likely overshoot because even as prices go up, because the business is capital intensive and cyclical, the industry won't be able to to create supply fast enough to meet demand. So if the uranium price, I said, if, (laughs) if the uranium price hits 55 or 60, I got to start to sell. And I did, (laughs) which means that the move from 80 to 140 took place without me. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely without me. And, it, you know, it felt uh, a little dumb at the time. But you'll remember uh, that a couple of things happened that uh, that era of very high prices uh, brought in a brand new producer, Kazakhstan. Uh, and that brand new producer became the world's lowest cost, high enough volume producer in a fairly short period of time. And on top of that, of course, we had Fukushima, which took out demand from the second largest nuclear consumer in the world. So then the price fell from 145 <laughs> all the way down to what, 12 or $14 uh, and set the stage for the recovery that we're seeing now. Uh, you'll recall again, the first time or second time you and I talked, uh, 
the uranium equation was the same as it had been in the year 2000. Right, right, right. The industry was making the stuff at that point in time for 15 or 16 bucks. Oh, well, pardon me, selling it for 15 or 16 bucks a pound. But now the International Energy Agency suggested that the fully loaded cost to produce a pound of uranium was up around 50. Uh, <laughs> and still, uh, uranium was essential for our economy. Uh, the price had to go up and the price could go up. So the price has gone up. Do you know the percentage of uh, electricity that in the United States that depends on uranium now? You said it was 19% before 2000. As I understand it now, uh, uranium as a percentage of total electricity consumption in the United States is between 12 and 13%. Okay. Uh, and baseload production has fallen now to 18 or 19%. Okay. But that doesn't matter. Uh, it's still a circumstance where if the price doesn't go up, the lights go out. So right now we have a circumstance where it costs about $60 a pound to make the stuff fully loaded and it sells for 45, meaning the industry is only losing $15 a pound and trying to make it up on volume. <laughs> uh, what's important to look at now, I, you know, I, I knew that arithmetically the price had to recover, but I also knew that as a consequence of Fukushima, that there were large amounts of physical inventory around uh, and the people who consumed uranium didn't have to do so in contract pricing, but could do it in spot pricing because of excess inventories. And I said at the time that you and I interviewed that I didn't know when we would chew through those, chew through those inter, uh, inventories. But when that happened, that I thought the price of uranium would begin to rebound. Uh, beginning three and a half years ago, I tried very hard to interest Sprott Inc. in getting control of Uranium Participation Corp and converting it to a trust. Uh, and they tried mightily for two and a half years and finally succeeded last year. And when I say succeeded, succeeded beyond my wildest dreams. I thought uh, because the volume in our precious metals trusts on the New York Stock Exchange exceeds our volume on the Canadian exchanges, nine to one, I had thought that we would need to domesticate uh, the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust under the New York Stock Exchange before we would see sufficient volumes to uh, finance in the, uh, you know, at the market financing mechanism and buy uranium. And I was way wrong. Uh, that trust has in four and a half months of existence raised 1.2 billion fresh US dollars, used it to buy 20 something million pounds of uranium. And I'm tempted to say that most of the surplus inventory available on the spot market has now been or, or will shortly be bought. At the same time, uh, and more importantly, long term, the political winds are finally blowing in favor of uranium as cheap baseload carbon free air. The Japanese nuclear fleet, which was somewhere between 40 and 50 reactors, I forget the exact number, frankly, has seen 11 restarts. But importantly, the Japanese government has uh, their 18 largest remaining reactors in for permitting for restarting this year, which means that beginning this year, uh, fresh demand for 10 or 12 million pounds a year is coming into the market on top of a market that is already consuming more uranium because of Chinese builds than pre-Fukushima. So we have a circumstance where the timing question has been answered. Now, you'll recall too, George, that six or seven months ago, the price of uranium equities got so hot, anticipating these trends, I guess, that uh, at least with regards to my juniors, I was forced to be a seller. Although I was long-term optimistic, I just wasn't willing to pay the price. Mercifully for me, now that the timing question has been answered, and now that the pace of Japanese restarts, which I myself identified as the catalyst, is beginning to occur, the index of uranium equities is off, depending on the index you use, between 40 and 50%. <laughs> so now that it's timely, uh, and now that the catalyst is in place, it's at a 50% off sale. Uh, these types of serendipitous good fortune uh, have occurred to me sort of once every 10 years of my life, and I'm delighted that in retirement they're occurring again.